everybody. Welcome to our coach development webinar. Today, we are joined by my good friend, Richard Shorter, who is the non-perfect dad. Our core value this month is unity, and our topic is managing the performance environment or managing the environment. So Richard, thanks for joining us. Welcome. Um, privilege. Yeah, privilege is ours. So Rich, why don't you just start by sharing your journey with us, a brief uh, share of your journey, and then let's see how we can tie our core value and managing the environment into what you do with Nonperfect Dad. Brilliant, mate. Well, thank you. Yes. So um, I'm dialing in from London, England, and I, I just have this bonkers privilege. Um, not quite sure how I got here, but I'm really glad that I am here uh, of working with uh, performance pathways, sports teams, soccer teams around the world in helping them to ha have better conversations between parents and coaches and players so that we can get better outcomes for kids um, and so that we can help kids have the mental skills that they need to take their sport into a hopefully a lifelong enjoyment of whatever level they play at but but for those kids who are lucky enough to be able to pursue a career in sport that they have the mental skills to make that last as long as possible and to take the opportunities that come with it so how did i get there a bit of a weird route really i'm a church minister in in a, a quite a poor part of east london um i was a youth worker first uh, and I've always just always worked with families, Chris. I recognised as a young 20-year-old who wanted to change the world that all this youth work I was doing, I needed to be engaging the parents more than I was engaging the kids. And so I've, I've spent 20 years working with lots of different organisations, schools, churches, social services, to try and help parents um, get their role, and I think parenting is a difficult role, and we'll explore that why shortly, but to help parents get their role, it's, it's been a great journey. I now work with some very difficult families in my local community that social services want me to work with, and I get to work with people like Manchester United and uh, England Rugby and uh, some great teams in America. So, yeah, it's brilliant. I, um, that's who I am, and that's what I do. Brilliant, brilliant. So I, I love what you said there, Richard, which is which was key for me but engaging the parents more than engaging the players. I thought that's huge, right? And the, the people, the children, I should say. So brilliant stuff. So Rich, let's, uh, let's go. I know you've got yeah. a presentation for us and I know we'll be taking questions. Just a reminder to everybody, pay full attention because Rich is gonna blow it our minds. Um, he might give us a hug, a nudge or a smack. Uh, we'll see uh -huh. where that goes, so. Brilliant, thank you. No, I'm not talking about those today, but good remembering, Chris. You'll have to look up my life. Uh, guys, listen, I hope you've got a pen and a bit of paper because we're learning that um, when we do online learning, it's, if we take notes, and by taking notes, we don't just copy what the speaker says, but actually if we take notes and then say, how does that work for me? How does that work in my context? Then then that helps us to, to take the, the learning deeper, especially because online we're, we're all a bit distracted, uh, a bit easier from what's going on. So I, I just want to ask a, t a quick question to start off with. What makes a team a great team? What makes a team a great team? And, and if you've got a chat box available, put some answers in the chat box. Chris will read those out for us. If you've got any questions as I go along, just ask Chris in the chat box and he'll uh, interrupt me and uh, do that but what makes a team a great team now my suspicion is that how you answer that if you came up with three or four um, character traits that make a team a great team you are going to talk about like togetherness or unity as part of your response to what makes a team a great team and the challenge for those of us involved in sport is to recognize that there are multiple layers of team going on all the time that actually that we need to be seeing the, the coach and the players on the pitch as as one team almost and then there's a team around the team um, and that often involves parents siblings uh, school coaches different coaches school coaches different relatives uh, grandparents aunts and uncles depending on the family makeup and for me this question of unity to help the kid get the best outcomes is about how do we coach support nurture connect with the team around the team because if we fail to do that well 
that means that our players have lots of different voices going on in their heads. And if they've got those voices going on in their heads, it makes it very hard for you as coaches, or it makes it hard for you as parents to help your child, young person, get the best out of their sporting journey. And one of the things that's exciting me in the sports world at the moment is how many senior teams are starting to appreciate the need for quality parent support all the way through an athlete's career. So, for example, the American Olympic team do some incredible work with the parents of their athletes during that Olympic cycle because they know that that team around the team are massively influential and support um, in how um, in how that athlete prepares themselves for the challenge of of sport. So I, I have the privilege in the UK of working in a sport called rugby uh, quite a bit, as well as working in football. But it, and in rugby, and I've been working with older players in the England rugby pathway because uh, the RFU recognise that if they're going to give these young men uh, and young women the best support they can have at being the best sport version of themselves, they need to be supporting the parents so that they can get, um, get, get the best support that they can do. So, um, Chris, can you see that screen all right? Yeah, we can see the screen. Um, we can see your side slides. So Danny, Danny Poche is, I, I typed in the chat, what makes a team a great team? And Danny said, everybody's on the same page with the same message and goals. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. So Danny is an seen. NCIS inspector. So you might see him on TV, right? Oh, wow. So, yeah, oh, as well cool. as a coach. Like so now you should see a, a slide that says unity with question mark on. I just want to check that that's... Yep, unity and a tree and then uh, it looks like some uh, a, a, an assembly line of dummies. Yeah, mate, that's from, I, that's from I Robot, Will Smith film. How can you not recognise that? Not a big uh, TV person, Rich. Uh, well, that's... We need, we need to, I'm going to send you that for Christmas now. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 check that's working. so so Chris has given me this great theme today about unity, which I which I really appreciate because for me that's at the crux of how we engage parents well and how we get unity with that team around the team. And I think there are different models of unity. I'm going to present a model today. Uh, it's not the model. There are different models out there. But uh, but hopefully you'll see the benefits um, and shortfalls of other models as well as this model as we go through. On the left, we've kind of got that unity that comes through the tree that's symbolized there. But we've got different color hands, different shape hands. There's not uniformity there, but there is unity. That's part of the same tree they're playing their role within that. And on the right, we've got dummies uh, or, or uh, uh, robots. <laughs> thank you, from the film I Robot with Will Smith, one of my favorite films, um, where they're all, like Chris said, he said dummies, because they're all identical. They all look exactly the same. And I think part of the challenge for us as people involved in sport is, I know we all know this, but sometimes I think our practices accidentally um, do something else and that is we know that human beings are very complex and diverse in nature um, and so the kind of unity that we need to be working towards i believe that's most helpful for young people is on the left there that kind of tree kind of shape of unity so that people we we recognize people are coming from different backgrounds different family makeups um different age or order you know you might have a child who's the youngest sibling you might have a child who's an only child the, the oldest adopted um fostered by grandparents you might have children from a very difficult social background you might have children from a very very affluent social background and recognizing that diversity within your team and, and actually, we're not going to get the iRobot uniformity. And, and no sports club, no school um, is ever going to get true iRobot uniformity. You only have to look at some of the top soccer clubs in the world. So let's take a quick look at Barcelona. Barcelona for like five, ten years have dominated, but they've got real problems at the moment. So they had this great system and everybody goes on about their culture and how their culture is brilliant. But actually, they've, they've got real problems at the moment. Where everybody thought that... Barcelona was like on the right uniform um, conformity. Everybody got the story. We're now seeing there's a lot of cracks in that um, environment. And as, as much as they're obviously amazing, 
uh, soccer players, etc., that w they're seeing that the unity is not as strong as it was previously thought. And and so I want to go through a journey with you now for about the next 30 minutes, and then we'll take questions at the end, about how to develop and continue to develop a soccer culture which helps you have the unity that's on the left. Um, and that's what I do with the clubs that, that I work with. Chris has already kind of introduced me, um, but you can find me on, on the social medias. I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn, and I'll give you my email address at the end. Um, I'm a dad, so I recognize the challenges. There's a team behind the team of non-perfect dad. Oh, I didn't explain why I call myself non-perfect dad. I call myself non-perfect dad because I don't think there's a perfect sports parent out there. And I think sports parenting is a lot easier if we're honest about our strengths and weaknesses, etc. So, and, and I saw lots of parenting coaches out there who presented perfection in their family life. And I knew that that was just not true. So I just call myself non-perfect dad. Look, I'm a dad of three, here they are. Doesn't he love his sisters? That oozes out of him there in that photo. Caleb is 15, mad about rugby. And in the UK, rugby is- We can't perfect. see that slide of Caleb, Richard. I don't know whether you changed the slide there. It keeps pausing, Chris. I don't quite know why. Let me- There we go. I see Caleb now. I, well, I see same destination, different paths. Now is it back on Caleb? No. Well, no, there's a three, there's your, it's not on I Caleb, what, there. now it's on Caleb. And there's Jess, I see Jess. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so <laughs> brilliant. So Caleb's 15. Thanks, Chris, sorry about that, mate. I don't know quite what's going on there. That's I have okay. Caleb, um, Caleb's 15, rugby mad, can't play rugby at the moment. And you're in the middle of a gymnast. So she's in an acro group. So two teenagers throw her around and she does these amazing flips. And um, I, I get such a thrill watching her, uh, even though my heart's in my mouth all the time. And, and Jess on the right, she plays a bit of field hockey and is massively into her drama. And I'm not here today to say, um, do this my way. I'm here to chuck out a bunch of ideas. I think we all want the same destination, which is kids loving and thriving um, in their sport, in their soccer. But I'm not here to, to you, you don't have to copy me. What I'm going to do is share some principles and I hope you then contextualize them to your context or bring your own learning and understanding in that. Now, here's a picture of a tree. This is my, um, this is on my walk, one, one of my favorite walks. Uh, these are a couple of beautiful old English oak trees. Uh, I want you to imagine that I, you and I were there together and I invited you to climb this tree. How high would you go in this tree? Would you go right to the top in that top bracket? Would you go in the middle area or would you keep your feet firmly on the ground? Now, I'm not, I'm not a small chap, so I might be tempted. So I'd quite happy to climb the bottom bit, maybe take the risk into the middle bit. Uh, and if I fell from that middle bit, I might get hurt, but it wouldn't be deadly. I'm not climbing to the top. My wife is a forest schools teacher, so she teaches kids outdoors education all the time. She'd happily try and climb to the top and let little kids climb to the top. But the, but the reason I show you that, that tree is because I want us to start to think about how we might embrace challenge and, and risk, because that for me is at the key of how we get unity. Um, together now, there's somebody called Barry Mason who's done some excellent work in psychology on um, on this, and he 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 divides people's um, attempts to engage in culture and learning and uh, growth into three areas. At the bottom, he calls safe and certain. So that is. Um, you know, I'm not going to climb that tree because I want to be completely safe and certain. I don't want there to be any risk in there. Um, the middle area of the tree, I've added the tree, by the way. Barry Mason doesn't talk about the trees, but I've added that to this. Uh, the middle is safe and uncertain. So I'm safe enough because I know I'm not going to fall to my death, but it's uncertain because some of these branches in the middle won't hold my weight. Some of these branches I've not climbed on before. There's a bit of risk here. There isn't always an easy path to go. Um, it isn't always going to work out okay, but but I'm going to be safe because I know I'm not going to die from, from climbing that high in the tree. And in the very uh, top is unsafe and uncertain. So that is every step any step that you go wrong up there, you're going to fall to your death. It's it's uncertain you're going to survive, even if you think you're safe. Um, uh, and and it and it's quite a dangerous place to be. And the challenge for institutions and organisations is if we want to help the team around the team be united and supportive of one another, we need to help them be that green section in the middle, safe but uncertain. Because you don't need me to tell you that if you're going to support a child, whether you're a coach 
or a parent through their sporting journey, there is an amount of letting go and an amount of risk and an amount of emotional uncertainty that comes through that experience. And if as coaches and sports organizations, we're not enabling parents to be in the green area, we land up with some quite nasty side effects. Uh, and these are the side effects that we will often get from parents when uh, they're complaining or challenging our decisions, or, or even there might be good parents on the sideline, um, and they might be really respectful to us, but what they model around about sport and failure and mental health skills and resilience in the home is actually really unhelpful for the child to develop. And so for me, if we can get unity uh, uh, in our sports clubs around being safe and uncertain, that's really, really helpful. So let me explain this a little bit more to you. Let me just jump in there real quick, Rich. Is that okay? Just to ask a question. So Danny's, Ooh. can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, Danny's question is, is, is this how the child sees it or how we see it through the adult lens? And I I'm probably think you were going to get to that. But, yeah. did, did, you know, if a kid was to look at that, would the blue, green and red be in the same <laughs> order? Brilliant. Yes. So that's a great question. And that, that the problem of using any analogy is that an analogy can break down. So like I, like I said, my wife wouldn't see it quite the same as me. Um, my children wouldn't see it quite the same, the same as me. But what we know from a psychological point of view is there, there are places to dwell which are safe and certain. There are places to dwell which are safe and uncertain. And there are places to dwell which are unsafe and uncertain. So let me, let me put that, and that's for all ages, but of course, that is slightly different for everybody. And so it's a really good question. And that's really important to hold on to uh, for later on. Um, but if we take that, um, if you look at this uh, graph, which is a graph version of the tree that I just gave you, what we know is if we, if we exist in a highly controllable, highly predictable environment, safe and certain, we know things are really stuck. So, so that, I'm sure we've all experienced the boss who says, well, we've always done it that way. You know, we've always done it that way, so we're not going to change, okay? Um, and and it's fascinating coming up to Christmas. I don't know what your kids are like at Christmas, but my kids at Christmas, we've changed some of the ways that we're doing Christmas this year, partly because of COVID and partly because we felt it was time to have like an evolution of, of what we did. And, and seeing my children's response to that has been really fascinating. Um, but Dad, we always do it that way. Okay, yeah, well, that's fine. Um, but why can't we change it? This is This is the opportunity that will come from doing from exploring the creative exploration of something something new the the challenge so let, let me just take some extreme examples okay safe uncertainty that's like my grandmothers who both lived to their 90s amazing women um, but they were really stuck in their perceptions of the world so politically they would never have considered um even listening to people from the other party that they didn't vote for because they were just absolutely stuck and absolutely certain about the rightness of that uh, political party. And, and we know that if you don't question your, your beliefs and have a bit of reflection, that that can lead to you to making unhealthy decisions. Um, in sports clubs, I see that all the time, that that they they have a way of behaving and that's the way we do it. So clubs will say, well, we've always coached like this, or this is how we've always done selection. And, and it isn't actually the best way of doing it, but because they've always done it like that, they, they continue. Now, the important thing to note here is the safe bit is psychologically we're safe because there's a strong identity, but we also do everything in a real certain way. So it's highly predictable. The problem is if you're gonna get better at something, you need to enter a space that isn't highly predictable. Okay, I've started drawing this year. Have I put one of my drawings on the slides? No, I haven't. I should have done that because my first COVID kind of lockdown thing was I started drawing. Um, I've always I'm rubbish. I'm absolutely terrible at it. But but the um, if you look at Friday Doodles on my Twitter feed, you'll see that I'm not great at <laughs> drawing. But the but the point is for me to get into doing something new i had to learn how to risk and and i realized recently that the most important bit of drawing equipment that i now own um is a is a rubber an eraser okay to rub out or to erase out the mistakes i make because i know that i need to be in creative exploration to get better at this thing called art and that if i didn't risk making a mistake that my art standard poor as it already is would not get any better and, and you think about a kid on a soccer field if they do not risk making a mistake, how are they going to get any better? And that is 
part of the challenge. So I play field hockey with my son. And I play, in, it's, I mean, I used to play quite a decent standard, but we don't play quite such a high standard now because he's still learning. There's a number of kids on the team and a number of adults on the team. Or when I say kids, they're kind of upper teenagers. Um, and it's fascinating to see some of the adults who get really cross with the teenagers trying new skills mid-game and then they fail and the adults tell them off. And I don't because I coach the side as well. I'm like, well, that's great, but well done for trying it. How can you make it better next time? But for those adults, they're stuck in safe and certain mode we're all part of this team, we have an identity, but we don't risk growth. And what that does is it holds those kids back from getting better. The flip side, and so how that works in parenting, sorry, let me not say the flip side yet, is you, you might have a great session. You might be a brilliant coach who's coaching your kids and your athletes to try something new on the soccer pitch, yeah? You've had a whole training session about it, you've got game day on Saturday or Sunday, and the kid tries something new, and you as coach, you are absolutely thoroughly chuffed because you saw a kid, they did something in training, and then they tried it on the side of the pitch. And then they get it back in the car with mom or dad or grandma or grandpa, and the first thing they say is, why did you try that? It didn't work, you failed. Don't try that again. Don't try and be clever like that. Don't try and do these things. So you can see that the parent voice then will drive the kid back into safe and certain into stuckness. And that's very, very difficult for children to have a thrill of creative exploration. My, my home parenting experience was very much bottom left-hand corner home parenting experience. Failures in the shorter household growing up were not, um, were not tolerated partly because they were seen as a failure of perception and pride in, in who we were as a family. So I've spent a lot of time as a, as a human being trying to be safer in safe uncertainty. The other extreme is unsafe and uncertain. That is really chaotic, really dangerous. Typically for a young person, that might be the young person whose parents are alcoholics or, or addicts of some sort. So the kid comes home from school, if they even go to school, and they don't know what mum or dad they're going to get. Or, or mum or dad might be a high-flying business person, and so if they've had a really good business day, they'll come home and mum or dad are really happy and joyful and uh, really loving and caring and affectionate. But if they've had a bad day, they'll be really angry, really grumpy. Uh, we've all seen coaches like that, haven't we, who, you know, it's, they're a bit inconsistent a bit hard to work out who they are that's the unsafe uncertain and the challenges with these things are so I can't remember the guy's name Chris who asked the question about how does the kid see it we all see situations slightly differently that's why this middle ground isn't quite a, a neat circle it's got boundaries this isn't saying to kids just go and explore without boundaries I, I, I as a dad have quite strong boundaries but I hope I also have quite a lot of exploratory areas for my kids to go and explore and try new things my son is mad about weightlifting and all that lot. Brilliant. He so, works so hard at it. Please don't tell him I said any of this. But he wants to build an outside gym at our house because he's got a small gym in his bedroom um, and he's outgrown it and he needs more weights. So he's come up with all these crazy ideas of how he's going to build a home gym. In my head, none of it is going to work. In my head, it's going to be a disaster. But I also think let him have this disaster. It's not the end of the world if he tries to put an outside shelter up and build an outside gym area. And do you know what? He might prove me wrong. He might prove me wrong, get a chunk of it right, and we'll be able to work on it together, which will be great dad, father, son time, and we'll, we'll then tweak it and tweak it and tweak it until we get it right. But I'm not going to say no to him. I'm not going to be stuck in safe and certainty because my adult head says, well, that won't work. I'm going to give him the chance and the boundaries to go and explore that within reason and learn from that and, and work and reflect on that. The challenge so, for us is, sorry Chris, go on. And the, the question again from Danny is like, how do we convince parents that it's okay to fail, right? So you've said you're gonna let um, Caleb build that gym, yeah. right? But you're gonna guide him, you're not just gonna say no. So how do we get other parents to think like you? And maybe I should hold off on the questions because I know you're going to hit some of these things within the presentation. It's to be a lot of things. So was it Danny who asked that question? Yeah, Danny again. He's on a roll right. today. We're going to make a great, great question. Is, did you say he was a detective? That's it. You see, he's like, he's digging NCIS, away. Yes, yeah. Hey, awesome. Cool. Um, so we're going to get there, Danny, but let me just explain. I think I think that is the, our process of parent engagement has to hold both the safe and uncertainty. So if we look at this little graph here I think that starts to lead us in the direction of answering that but if you don't think I answer it fully nudge me again and we'll come back and answer it fully if at sports clubs we tend to get conformity from people so safety 
here, when we think about safety, we need to think about identity. That's what Dan, um, Barry Mason was really thinking about. Is there psychological identity safe? I, I grew up a shorter, Richard Shorter is my name. So I know my home identity. We have a very strong culture as a family, but it's very certain. So, so bless my poor mum having to deal with these changes to her Christmas in COVID. She, she's really struggling, really, really struggling with it because it's, 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 it's not comfortable for her. And for her, it feels unsafe and uncertain because it's been pushed on her. She feels like it's anarchy if you look at this. It's not anarchy, but that's how she feels. Um, uh, but we all know that we have parents who could just conform to our cultural standards because they think that's the dumb thing to do. But we, we know that they weren't really conforming because as soon as we deselect their child or there's a real problem, they write a really nasty letter to us or get really, really cross with us, okay? We know that there are organizations that are unsafe but provide lots of certainty. And that is um, for organizations, that's just quite oppressive. I know plenty of sports organizations that I think are pretty out of order to the team around the team. So, for example, there's a premiership football club in the UK that don't allow siblings into the training ground. OK, now, what is a parent meant to do if they've got three kids and they've got one kid in a premiership football academy and they've got to juggle the lifts and the journeys to and from. But their kids, because it's a high performance environment, their younger kids or older kids aren't allowed to come into the training ground. I think that's quite an, an unhelpful not it's oppressive with a small o, I think that but but we get kind of that oppressive environment um and then unsafe and uncertain it just leads to anarchy in, in groups and and those teams don't I'm sure none of you are involved in those teams because I can imagine I can't imagine anybody would come <laughs> into a webinar if they led a, a, an organization like that because they they wouldn't be up for it the the challenge for us is how do we help parents get into that top right hand bracket of growth that is the question how do we help parents be a little bit like me um, although I am non-perfect, so I'm sure I will get that wrong with Caleb. Um, the, the, the challenge for that conformity is we do it, but we don't really want to. Um, for the unsafe certainty, basically someone's a bully. For unsafe uncertainty, no one's leading and everyone's leading all at the same time. It's just chaos. But for, uns for, sa sorry, for safe uncertainty growth, we're going somewhere together. Now I need to be really, really clear. This isn't a, this isn't guaranteeing you a destination. It's guaranteeing you a journey. Gosh, how cliched is that in this day and age? But you you know what I mean. So so we're not guaranteeing that every parent will be okay with failure by the time you finish this process. What what we are, I think, guarantee is a big word. And I would probably say I would guarantee is that if you manage to structure an environment like this, you are helping parents as best as you can move towards that. So how do you do that? um in this environment I'm, I'm just going to share some of the ways that, that we've that, that we've done it one i think you just need to be really self-aware um of how you come across to coaches uh, to, to the team around the team and how your organization does doesn't mean you're wrong by the way um self-awareness isn't like about beating you with a stick but i would for stars i would ask parents questionnaires about how do you find the club give us the top three words that describe our club give us um, what do you like about our coaches? What can our coaches do better? Don't be afraid to get questionnaires out there. Don't be afraid to ask the kids questions. So, so what? Some of the most powerful. I've got kids' voice on there, but when it comes to self-awareness, some of the most powerful things we do now. I, I don't work with Arsenal Football Club, but I have done this in football clubs that I've worked in. But Arsenal Football Club got all their um, their kids to write their parents' letters about how they loved what their parents did for them in soccer and how they wanted their parents to behave around soccer. Then they took some juicy quotes out of those letters before they sent them individually to the parents. And they have put these juicy quotes all around the, um, the parents' coffee area. So you might not have that facility if it's not your own building, but you might be able to get some of those boards to do that because the kid's voice is like really important. So, and the kids will talk a lot about failure. If you go on my Twitter feed, you'll see a teacher in a primary school um, near here. Um, uh, that's a junior high school. Is it junior high, Chris, in your age group, primary? Yeah, anyway, younger kids, like kids who are seven, eight and nine, just talking about what they want their parents to do around sport. And it's really lovely, but they talk in there about just let's fail, let's fail. So it's talk, getting kids to talk about that. The second thing we, we want to be doing is we want to be helping um, parents realize sport is subjective. OK, and what do I mean by that? I mean, like there is no one right coaching way. There's no one right formation. There's no one right team selection. There's no one right way of doing soccer. There are lots of healthy ways and there are clearly some unhealthy ways. 
but the fact that you guys are here tells me you're good coaches because you've come on to um, come to listen. And, and so if we can help um, parents and talk to parents about how subjective sport is. So one way to do this is to get um, 10, 10 of the top world's top players and tell the parents they have to select a five-a-side team out of those 10 top players. The parents will not be able to come up with a completely agreed five-a-side team out of those 10 players, okay? Because they won't be able to do it. Um, now, one of the other th things to do for parents, and this links into the safety bit, is help parents realize that it's okay that this is emotional, okay? That this sports journey for parents is emotional. And by saying it's okay to be emotional in this, we're, we're, we're demonstrating safety. Look, it's safe here to be emotional around this. Um, and we need to be exploring those emotions so that we are um, parenting from an emotionally balanced and stable place after the sports journey. So one of the re ways we handle failure um, as coaches is when we do our post-match team talks, you get the parents around your team talk, okay? And I wouldn't use your post-game team talks for anything really te technical or tactical. I would use it all for setting up the car conversations on the way home afterwards, okay? So you basically, let's just say, you just had a game and, and a couple of kids tried some things and they didn't work out. You get them around and you say to the kids, I just want to identify Chris today. Chris tried something new and, and the courage that he did that. Can we just give him a round of applause? I really love the courage that he showed. In this club, we try new things. In this club, we try our skills out. It didn't work this time, mate. We're going to work together to help make it get better next time. Uh, Chris's parents, in the car on the way home, can you just chat to Chris about some of the failures you've had at work and how it's helped you be a better person and how failing is okay? So do you see what I've, re I mean, I haven't quite told the parents exactly what they have to say, but I've really pinned the parents in there to having that conversation. But what parents will do is, because you have an outline, Chris, you've praised Chris in front of the other parents, in front of the other kids. They'll be like, oh, wow, my boy got some praise. Isn't that brilliant? That's really, really good. And that takes the emotion out of the parent feeling like, oh, they failed in front of everyone. Because that's often why parents struggle with failure. Um, because they feel like their kid has publicly let themselves down and we have this whole pride thing going on and this whole I want I want my kids to not look like failures that's very common and very normal um, and even I get that sometimes a little bit as well so so we want to be helping parents have good conversations um, I've also written a book I'm gonna I, I was showing it but the screen's not on called conversations for the journey Chris reminded me it earlier and that's 40 ways for parents to have really healthy conversations in the car before and after sports fixtures that help parents journey through some of the sportsmanship, em emotional way of handling this. Now, I was working with a team in Utah, some great people down there, and one of the things that they recognized in their sports teams is that it did not give the opposition enough respect. The parents weren't giving the, the opposition enough respect and weren't cheering the um, opposition, or not cheering, at least celebrating the, an opposition goal, clapping the opposition off and on the pitch, showing the referee respect. So what we did together is we developed a pre-season video course called Their Best Season Yet. And all the parents who registered at that club had to go through that video course. And the results have been amazing. And what the video course was, was a five minute video of me that they watched with their kid and then they did a little bit of a worksheet and it was 10 videos in total. In fact, this soccer team I said to the parents they had to watch five, but 98% of the parents, over 500 did it, watched all 10 videos. And what, what we're doing there is we're really helping parents feel safe to talk about the issues, but we're giving them the uncertainty bit that we might want to stretch their learning and take the parents into a new place. And so that video course just, just has had incredible impact. And, and now premiership football teams have used video courses like that in a similar way. So what, what I do when I arrive at a club is find out where parents are being emotional and how that's expressing itself. Where is their non-unity in this place? And then how do we help walk parents through a journey? And, and that's always bespoke to each club. But those who have taken up the video course, it's like, right, how do we help parents and kids have really good, safe conversations at the beginning of the season so that they get the need to be able to be a bit more adaptive and change a little bit? If we're going to have safety, we really need deep connections with parents. Okay, In the UK, that's really hard at the moment because parents aren't allowed near training grounds because of COVID. I don't know, uh, some of you guys, I think, have probably got similar rules in America, depending on what your state rules are around COVID. We really need to find good ways of helping the parents feel deeply connected. And that's whether you as a coach are ringing the parents, saying, how are you? Not every week, but certainly ringing them, 
how's it going? How's your kid? What can I do to help? Um, having good socials with the parents, because that safety thing is about that identity. If if we can make parents feel like they're really valued in this place, it gives us more permission to stretch and change them. Okay. If we can make parents feel, I'm going to repeat that, if we can make parents feel really safe, that we really value them, it'll give parents bigger emotional and psychological permission to try parenting slightly differently. If we are just telling parents how to behave and just giving them a list of rules, we might get conformity out of them for a short period of time, but we don't get good quality growth for those kids. And so we need genuine connection. I meet so many coaches who cannot stand parents. And I understand why, because they've had really difficult experiences with parents. But I've got to be honest with you, you've got to drop that resentment, you've got to drop those wounds, and try really, really hard to build good connections with parents that's safe. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to become their best friends or disclose all your own issues or challenges or have them even around your own house or if you want to that's great but but a lot of the families i work with as a church minister i i work really really hard on on creating safety so when i run parenting courses for our local authority they can't believe how many people we get on the parenting courses how many people stick the parenting courses and how many people stay in touch afterwards i don't think it's rocket science as to why we do it we do it because i go around their house i have a cup of tea and sometimes their houses are in a bit of a state but i'm the first person to cross their threshold play with their dog talk to their kids and not stand there with a clipboard. Not Because social workers don't sit down. They stand in the corner. They don't sit down. They don't have a cup of tea. That's fine. That's their own professional boundaries. I'm not criticizing for that. But I get to have different professional boundaries. And, and I just make the parents feel like, hey, this bloke Richard, he kind of gets us. And it's the same. So I'm coaching now. And it's the same. I try in the car park and just get around to the parents beforehand. Hey, how are you? I love the fact that they, co they come along. They're really good at this. It's great to have them with us. Just that real encouragement to help them feel safe and get that connection and identity. The next thing I think we just want to say is behavior is not, oh, that should say statements. How many, like, I mean, such like management speak these days to have a vision statement and purpose statement and values and all that kind of stuff. Nothing wrong with any of them. But my experience, particularly in sports clubs, is all those values and mission statements, they just gather dust on a document somewhere. We don't think about the behaviors that go with those. And, and so if we want to help parents get that, I don't know, let's say one of your behaviors is we try, we fail, and we try again. So failure is like a cool thing. We have to teach parents what that conversation actually looks like. It's no point in just saying at our club, it's okay to fail. It's a great statement, but what does, it actually, what does that behavior actually look like for a parent in the car journey? What does that behavior look like for a parent in the car when the kid is sobbing their eyes out because they tried something that didn't work and they feel embarrassed in front of their mates because they're a teenager and that's how the teenage brain works? What does that look like when it's your kid who's got to take a penalty in a final and they miss. What does that look like when your kid doesn't get selected? So we need to walk parents through these scenarios and, and start to coach them on what their behaviors look. That's what I spend a lot of my time doing, coaching parents through those conversations. We also need to coach parents through the subjective conversations around how to talk to the coach. So again, I spend a lot of my time and a lot of the work that I do with institutions is to help you coach the parents into a safe uncertain way of communicating with you when it doesn't feel right for the parent they might not be right in their complaint but if they've got a complaint we want to help them express it in a safe and uncertain way so i spend a lot of time coaching parents how to do that so we might say for example our statement might be oh well we respect coaches here great statement don't disagree with it at all but what does it actually mean when your blood is boiling smoke's coming out of your ears and you're really hacked off with your kid's coach okay well i think it means this type the email type the email out as angry as you can but do not hit send under any circumstances okay then uh, d write a second email saying i'm not very happy about what happened the other day is it possible for us to have a chat about it okay i feel uncomfortable about this can we please have a chat about it so we're teaching parents what respecting the coach looks like we're not just saying respect the coach that's a statement we're teaching about the behaviors that come for that in normal real day circumstances because sport is emotional for parents that's why we've got this is emotional it's subjective that's why it's subjective so we teach parents how to have behaviors around the subjective emotional challenges that come along and lastly and i've kind of touched this already we just use the kids voices a lot so we get the kids we 
one school I worked with in Dubai, that was a pretty exciting trip. But after I left there, they, they carried on doing some great work. And what's, one of the things they did, they had a hyper-competitive parent set. Like, I mean, ridiculously competitive, win at all costs. Kids could die as long as they won. You know, that's okay, a slight extreme. But they were probably the most hyper-competitive um, parent set that I'd worked with. So their coaches produced videos of the kids each week talking about what they'd been working on and why that was going to be a win this weekend and then they got the parents to count the things they'd been working on so they might have been looking at like one twos or control or whatever and they got the parents to count that so we re slowly recalibrated the parents understanding of winning but we didn't try and tell parents that winning wasn't important because that's too big a jump um because and there's nothing wrong with winning by the way in fact you need to be a winner to understand how to deal with winning as well as understand how to deal with losing as well um but but we so we kept it competitive because this was a competitive group of parents we weren't going to um change that overnight but we changed it so the parents felt safe about measuring something else rather than just the end result have that school gone from uh, the most competitive parents to the most mellow parents no they haven't they're on a journey but they're far better in a, in a healthier position with their kids than they were in 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 the first place. Now I'm going to shut up there because I, I don't know. I, I don't, oh, let me just show you one other way. We just talked about behaviours. So you talked about how to deal with failure. This is something that I did with my kids during lockdown. It's developed by some great guys from the Magic Academy. They started it and, I, and then I've adapted it. Um, but from a guy called John Fletcher. So in my household, we I wanted to start to identify behaviours, not just statements, that were helping my kids grow in lockdown. Because I don't know about what your kids were like in, in lockdown for you, but in the UK, it was really hard to know how well they were doing. They were doing online learning instead of classroom-based learning. The teachers were doing their best, but it was all a bit weird. So we in our household came up with these character traits and we defined them about what we wanted to do. We had a commander, so that was good leadership. So if our kids showed good leadership, we were like, great commanding today. If they were wizards, that was um, that was some some problem, some creativity. Sorry, that was creativity. If they showed some great creativity, it's like great wizardry there to come up with something new and creative. If they were scientists, it was problem solving. So if they came, they solved a problem. Great, great bit of scientists were. And I found during lockdown, I was forever the guy that they came to to help sort out their computers and things like that. I became the IT support, which I'm not great at IT, so it really. But I was able to say to them, go and be a scientist, go and try and work this out. And they knew immediately the Q word was scientist. They need to go and do it. Medic was about showing care to one another, and warrior was about um, uh, like just great hard work endurance leadership um on on the pitch now they changed that a little bit sorry if this upsets you because they showed my kids i i showed my kids this one but said they could adapt it they dropped princess leia and uh the guy from gladiator and they put their obamas in and then they put the scientist whose name's completely gone out of my head from um hidden lives film the nasa mathematician and they kept the others uh, others there so that's just a little example and then we've got that out into sports clubs so that coaches can be saying on the pitch great bit of commanding great bit of wizardry great bit of science work so i got great bit of scientist great being a medic great bit of warrior and defining the behaviors so to your kids if you've got younger kids this will work really well i think it actually works with teenagers not badly as well and it also helps parents see oh we're working on being warriors today or we're working on being medics today or we're working on being scientists we're working on being commanders and it just gives you a shorthand a keyword that parents um, can then understand what you're trying to do in the background. Kids are really good at coming up with these, by the way. So in your club, you might have a wizard, might be Messi, you know, great, great work by Messi there. Um, so you might have footballers or soccer players, sorry, that you identify. My family's into rugby, hence the fact that we've got rugby players there. I mean, there's my email address, richard at nonperfectdad.co.uk. I just, I just want to say, I've really enjoyed this chat. And we're going to open up for questions in a minute. I'm conscious we've kind of done some deep stuff. I hope there was a useful thread there. For me, if we're going to get genuine unity, we need to create a safe space where everybody feels like we have an identity, but we need to create a space where we're willing to explore the new together. And that is done. There aren't like a simple set of rules for exactly how to do that. Hopefully you've picked up some practical ways of doing it. But the way I work is it's often bespoke. So in all the sports clubs I work at, it's always just me having a chat with coaches, talking through what it might look like, and then maybe we produce some resources together. So honestly, give me, drop me an email. We'll have a phone call. I'm not gonna, I don't charge anybody for phone calls. I love speaking to sports coaches or to parents. 
um, and we'll explore whether there's some non-perfect ad resources or work that would work for you. Maybe that video course would work really well or, or a bespoke version of that video course would work really well in your club to help your parents start the season in safe uncertainty. Maybe it's getting some copies of Conversation for the Journey in, um, uh, whatever. But whatever it might look like, just give me a buzz because I love to chat with, with sports coaches and I'll help you work out how to create a safe, uncertain environment culture so that you can be um, working towards unity with that team behind the team. So my email address is richard at nonperfectdad.co.uk and I'm going to stop screen sharing there. Uh, Brilliant. Thanks, Rich. We're back on camera. You were on camera the whole time, by the way. Um, oh, yeah. So just the warrior, what was the, what was the part with the warrior? The warrior? Because I, I, I had the... Hard work. So that hard we work. Had, had the South African rugby captain who's if you're into sport, his journey like from abject poverty to winning the World Cup last year, amazing sports story. You'll love it, whatever sport you're into. And Sarah Hunter, who's the England women's rugby captain, just an incredible female professional athlete. Um, so I deliberately try and put a man and woman on there because I've got boys and girls. I want my kids to have good role models of both genders. I unashamedly do that. Um, I think that's an opportunity for me to be able to do that. But yeah. And, and it's and Clubs that take it on, it's got good success. And I'm trying to bring it in with my coaching now as well. So, yeah. Super. And I know Rusty and Fletch use it a lot, who are legends yeah. at the Magic Academy. So just so I've got this while it's fresh in my mind, Commander was leadership, Wizard was creativity, Scientist was problem solving, Medic was care, and then the yeah. Warrior was the hard work. So you've already given me an idea from that to, to how do we get male and female footballers or soccer players how do we tie that into one of our values and how do we how does that look in training and stuff like that but you you pack some brilliant stuff but while we're on the video courses and the book do you want to hold up the book and show yeah, everybody yeah, oh yeah oh no i was on all the time again my book. yeah so there's the book it's it's a fantastic it's a fantastic read um for some reason i can't locate mine but i've got to look through my my bag a little bit better um but th that's okay so it is a fantastic read so i i I would encourage anybody to to go to the, Rich's website, and it should be available from your website too, right, Rich? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's available from my website. It's cheaper from Amazon because they print it and pop it, you know. But if you don't want to use that huge conglomerate, I'll happily post you a copy from the UK, and hopefully, I'll get to you for Christmas. So. Brilliant, fantastic. So you just so much to unpack there, right? And you said, Rich, so many coaches that you speak to dislike or are uninterested um, in talking to parents and, and reasons, you know, why, whatever. Um, so very interesting, very interesting, right? And I love the way you, you call them the team around the team. I've, I've called them the team behind the team and actually used some of the stuff that you've sent and it's, it's worked like a charm, but it's so much easier um, when everybody is on the same page, you've shared the expectations, and the parents have been involved in those expectations, right? Instead of having a list of rules um, that they have to follow. So that's huge, right? Mm. Um, Danny, our resident question, uh, NCIS guy, he says, and I think you answered this a little bit earlier, but maybe we can go to it. He says, parents sometimes want to win right now and for their child to be the best. How can we connect their goals to their child's goals on and off the field? Great, great question, mate. Um, so a, a number of things. Um, let me let me share a picture with you because why not? I don't know if I'll find it on a PowerPoint. Um, that's one of the things I really like about the video course, and there are other ways of doing it. I don't want to just pretend that that's the only way of doing it. I, I think the, the video course really gives kids a voice in that. Why do you play? What you're hoping to get out of this season? And it gives somebody external way of um, of sharing. Uh, let me just their best season yet. Let me just play this because I just think it's. Can you see that slide? Yep. Sports. Yeah. So then these are my national drawings, and I've just drawn what what do you want for your kid on the left trophies or B? You want them to grow in those skills, yeah? Because the reality is, Danny, we need to let parents know you can get loads of trophies, but you don't necessarily grow in B. Okay. And I and I've I've worked with some people whose kids have not had enough losing in their lives. And they, 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 that's really problematic for them. 
really, really problematic for their future development. And so most parents, when you show them a, a rough, rubbish picture like that, they'll go, oh, yeah, we really want B. We'd like A as well. And I'm like, that's cool, because B often leads to chunks of A, and there's nothing wrong with A. There's absolutely nothing wrong with A. The problem is if A is the sole focus, we can miss out B. And, and, and so um, I... Uh, through my rubbish drawing. Um, I think it's it's that kind of slightly prophetic edge of using of using and celebrating different things. So if you've got kids who are part of your your soccer club, I get them to come back and give a testimonial. Like not not a testimonial of like yeah we won the 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 county cup and we I mean America you give rings for winning trophies down. I love that. I think that's so cool. We don't do that in the UK. I want to win a, I want to win a ring or something. Um, but but the but, and there's nothing wrong with winning those rings, but but tell the story, own the story, shape the story around that safe uncertainty of like, actually, here were these kids, and and the, this is this is what they got from it. I, I'd want to interview a 20 year old who's been through your program, and I'd want to say like, you're working now, mate, or you're at college. The skills you learn from us, how they're helping you be a better student, a better employee, a better partner, a better husband, a better well, not hopefully 20, they're not husbands and wives and parents yet, but you know, on, on that journey, how has what we've done helped you be better at that? Are you perfect at those things? No, okay, that's cool. You're still growing because I'm 42. I don't know about you guys, but at 42, I haven't nailed all, all the development of those things. So so I think so so shape that story. Shape the story before and after fixtures. Let parents know what you're working on. There will be games in a season you want to win. Of course there are, and that's okay. But 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 as coaches, you really need to make sure you're not treating the build-up to those games any differently than you're treating the build-up to the games that you don't care. Because as soon as you add emotional stuff in there, then kids and parents pick up on that, and that becomes really problematic. Um, my son's local rugby club, they have some rivals. I mean, it's hilarious how much rivals. But the coaches, the three weeks before, are like, these are must-win games, you must train harder. And you can just see the anxiety levels rise, and no wonder parents then get more anxious and grumpy, and, oh, it just does my head in. Um, so but they're great coaches, and the pastoral care they offer my son is, is second to none. I wouldn't want him to change clubs. I just wish sometimes around those conversations they'd chill out a bit. So really think about what you model in those areas and and, and enable – um, uh, enable the kids to kind of have a voice about that development if you're lucky enough to have the time and the people to have an individual development plan so that you can get the parents so so it's fa individual development plans are fascinating um, coaches and clubs and schools will have them I've yet to see one which has a space on it for parents to sign and say what they're going to do to help their kids grow in that so so again you might have a kid says, this season I want to grow in these three things and my coach Chris and Danny are going to help me do this and my school are going to help me do this and mum and dad, here it is. Well, I would say, hang on, mum and dad, that's the first half. The back pages, they want to grow in their hard work. What are you going to do? How are you going to help them do that? And don't just tell them, well, you need to be more resilient. How are you going to help them be more resilient? Oh, okay, well, as a club we're doing, I mean, resilience is one of the things that does my head in because it's an overused word, a very important thing, but it's just, we just we command resilience. You just need to get more resilient. No one's ever got more resilient because they've been told to get more resilient. You need to be coached through the skills that come with getting more resilient. And so we need to help coach parents to coach those into their kids. Yeah, brilliant. And, and obviously, Rich, I think, obviously through the pandemic, right, it's uh, it's an opportunity to to teach resilience, right? Because things aren't normal, right? It's an opportunity to be creative and change and 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 see those things. Um, so you know, I think sometimes it's the, the there's Bill Beswick, right? The applied sports psychologist, the pioneer in the English game. He always says the face of the coach is the health of the team, right? So I, I've changed that, and I like to say the face of the parents is the health of the family. Right. Mm. And you could even say the face of the, the parents on the sideline is the health of the team. So, mm. you know, how do we how you know. So, for example, um, if it's Armageddon, DEFCOM 9 as a parent, well, your child's going to be that way, too. Right. Um, I mean, there are days when I know because I sometimes wake up out of, get out of bed the wrong side. Is that for, he's in America in the UK? That yeah. basically just. Yeah. You know, I've got a grumpy head. I'm overtired, and I and I know within an hour of being up, now my kids are grumpy, and that's because I came downstairs grumpy. And my wife yeah. will very lovingly tell me they weren't grumpy before you got, but I just yeah. bring that piece of grumpiness into the home environment, and all of a sudden everybody's grumpy. Um, 
and it's fascinating you know our dog died in the summer I'm about to get a new dog and um reading the dog training books again and um sorry if you're a cat lover but it's that whole thing about the kind of presence you give with your dog is the kind of presence you get back off them generally and it and it's thinking about how we help parents realize that their own emotional regulation and the emotional state they're in has such a big impact on their kids sport experience so i say to a parent it's totally okay to be steaming mad after your kids play sport just don't let your kid know that walk off the kids got to get changed go for a drive ask someone else to go and buy them a bit of food or whatever while you just go and grit it all out or go for a quick run or whatever and then when you pick the kid up you, you've done it because yeah. the biggest mistake parents make is the first question they ask a kid is often to in re to regulate their own emotions not to help the kid move forward in this and that is the problem yeah and and, and i think it's huge there so a little little story rich um had this experience we had a kid who was going through on goal and the parents were cheering encouraging but also directing kid misses <laughs> the shot uh 10 year old starts crying right yeah so uh during that game though there was a kid that uh made a mistake right so i let him get through a few plays then i took him out took him out of the game and i said to him hey come talk to me when you're ready Let, let's talk about what just happened um i think my tone and delivery were off um but it also resulted in that 10 year old boy crying, right? But I wasn't mad at him. I think he was reflecting and, and stuff like that. And then, you know, I sent the other coach over because we have a thing where the kids go clap the parents. And I just, I said to the other coach that was with me, Coach Isaac, will you do me a favor and just go across with the young lad? Because I want to see the parents that they they had an impact on this boy and he was crying. And you know, I do a, you should do an email, um, a looking back, looking forward to talk about what we did last week and what we're doing next week. Um, and I just said, uh, you know, in that email, I put, you know, we had two 10 year old boys crying. The parent behavior was one and my timing, tone, delivery were another, right? Yeah. I never want to be the reason why a kid's crying. So I, I apologize publicly, right? And then I brought the kid in and apologized in front of the group because I didn't want to be the reason for any child crying, you know? Um, yeah. So it was, a, you know, I got a text from the mom and she's like, man, that showed real humility and um, vulnerability. And we appreciate you doing that. Uh, I, and I just think we have these opportunities to show people that we are in fact human beings, not human doings. Um, and just, you know, to keep involving the parents because they know the child so much better than us as coaches, right? We get them for three hours a week potentially and they get them, you know, the other time and just understanding what's going on in the world right now with online schooling. Um, yeah, and know, I, I, I think we're gonna have more emotional parents on the sideline when we slowly return because everybody's just that a bit more heightened and a bit more emotional. So. You're going to see, but Chris, what I also love that you did there is you really modeled safety. You know, we've been talking about the safe uncertainty. You modeled the safety to say, actually, I put my hand up. I'm, it's okay to put your hand up. Uh, it's okay to be honest. This is our identity, our safe identity here is we don't just sweep things under the carpet. We talk about it. We're honest, mate. It's just a great bit of modeling that you that you did there, as, as well as that's quite an unsafe thing for you to do because you kind of, it's kind of, it's a bit of a risk to put that out there because you, you, you know, you, someone could have taken umbrage at, at that but they didn't and and even if they had it was still the right thing to do so yeah. so it's not so make great stuff yeah well i couldn't be upset with the parents for making a kid cry when i did the same thing right no. so but it was a journey it is and i think part of my challenge with parenting is that i think it's okay that parents sometimes make their kids cry if 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 it's if it's well i mean if you're beating a kid sorry i don't think that's okay but you know we ask the wrong question at the wrong time and it will and it will trigger something in them and it's then helping them regulate themselves and then come back and say i asked you that i got it wrong a bit but do you know why it triggered you and often we find out it wasn't us we were just the last straw that we were the straw that broke the back kind of thing you know it, it's that kind of challenge it's like, it's like us at work you know someone will come in and ask you something you'll snap back at them you're like whoa i didn't sorry i've had four great emails i didn't get to see last night and another with the kids and you've just come and asked me something that wasn't your fault. I'm sorry. That wasn't fair. 
Um, that's human, that's human experience. Um, if anybody can walk around zen-like and not deal with any of that, great, good on you, but the rest of us are human. And so, so it's okay to explore that together if you've got a safe space to do it. And I think you really modeled that. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, Rich, I've had you on for an hour. I wanna be sensitive to your time. I wanna open up if there are any questions. Um, yeah, Danny, if you have another questions, please go ahead. Um, everybody else on there, please go ahead too. And anybody who thinks of questions, who watches this after, Richard has shared his email address and he's brilliant sure. at, back, at getting back. So, you know, go ahead. We'll give it a, another second, Rich. And uh, what what I'll ask Rich is, is there is there anything we didn't touch upon or any advice you would give to coaches on how to bring those parents in uh, a little quicker, right? And get the fences down. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, I, I think yes. I, the other thing I didn't say is use the good parents. So use parents to mentor parents. So if you've got some parents who nail this for you, make them the parent monitors, get them, and if, especially at the start of the season, get them to be the parents who, who go up to other parents and go, hi, we've been here a few seasons, Welcome as a new parent. This is how we work here. This is the best way. This is the way to get the best out of coach. This is the way to best communicate. By the way, we know it's frustrating. Give them a script if necessary, but good parents won't need a script. Good parents will be like, look, we love to see our kids win, but we don't focus on that here. We certainly clap the opposition if they score a goal. We never argue with the ref. And they're also the sort of parents, you know, you will have a mum or dad who doesn't have the fear to go up to a gobby parent and go, hang on, we don't criticise the referee here or whatever. Yeah. I, I've... All parents up for criticizing the referee it hasn't always gone well but most of the parents appreciated it on the sideline so i challenged a dad recently not recently before the first lockdown not recently at all but the last time i was watching competitive sport my son in he he was shouting at a young female referee and i was just like i just said to him mate i don't think that's helping the players i don't think that's fair and he got the right half but every other parent on the sideline went thanks so much rich we we were feeling comfortable so he's he's i'm not getting a christmas card from him this year chris but yeah. what i have done is the rest of the parents are like yes that's the standard we want to live to we can do that so use your good parents as well i think that's huge and I, and I think you may not be getting a christmas card from him but you definitely be getting the the christmas card from that young female referees uh so, parents right so brilliant I, I think i love that so just having the idea of having a culture keeper is what we would call them right a culture keeper on the sideline is huge you know yeah. get your little spies out to do yeah. your little to do little bits and pieces yeah. brilliant and danny just typed in thanks for sharing uh, such a unique perspective um and brilliant information cool thanks danny mate yeah brilliant so rich no further questions at this minute oh. Right, I think you answered them all in the presentation. Um, just to reiterate, uh, thank you so much on behalf of Rush Soccer. Thanks to Sky as well for letting us use her forum, which shows my name as Sky Eddie. Um, but also, again, just check out Richard on social media, check out his website, email him, he's brilliant. Um, and look into the, the conversations for the journey home um, or to and from, but also the, the, the video courses the video courses. So brilliant, enjoyable. Uh, Matt Ream just said, thanks, Richard, you were super. I don't know about the guy hosting in the pink t-shirt. He says, yeah. um, thanks, Reamy. I'll see you in Iowa. Um, but brilliant, Rich. Thanks so much. Uh, fantastic. Thanks to everybody who will watch this later. Remember, December, unity and managing the environment. And Richard has just given us some magical tips to be able to secure the team behind the team. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Okay.